evening. Um, I am uh, Helen Rizzo, and I'm the chair of the Department of Sociology, Egyptology, and Anthropology, now known as the C Department. And I'm very thrilled to have with us tonight Dr. Fadwa El Gindi, and to have President Richard Joni and Dean Rob Switzer and Provost Abdul. Uh, Ihab Abdul Rahman join us tonight and all of my lovely students, thank you for coming and uh, faculty colleagues. Uh, and uh, so we will be seeing tonight uh, Dr. Fadwa's film, El Sabua, uh, Egyptian Birth Ritual. And now I would like to welcome President Richard Joni to the podium to make some remarks. Thank you, Professor Helen. So I actually just wanted to um, set the stage a little bit about some of the reasons I'm here and, and we're here, but to give some, curi some background information I think you'll enjoy. A and we'll show the meaning and the importance of anthropology and gender studies. So a couple of you might have heard this before when Dr. Fadwa came before, but it's a story of how um, the friendship that uh, Dr. Fadwa and I have Barbara, hello, welcome. I didn't see you come in. How we met, and it really was what we now call gender studies. It was so long ago, Fadu, I don't know, you, you probably remember, or Helen, when they started using the term gender studies. But it, the Sabo, I mean, now is a classic of, of, the, of the field. But I, I first saw it not as a student, not as a formal student, but as a young foreign service officer. There was something I was, some of you know, I used to be a diplomat, American career foreign service officer. And in the course of that, you get on the job training. You get a lot of free education you don't have to pay for. I got language training, I got area studies. So in the context of area studies at the, in the American Foreign Service Institute, we bring in eminent speakers. Some are practitioners and some are scholars. And uh, in the con this was like 1979 maybe? So before most everybody in this room was born, certainly long before the students were born, before uh, Professor Helen was even born, is when we met. And so at the Foreign Service Institute, um, Dr. Fadwa presented what was then a pretty new film, right? Or is this the one I helped you get the... We don't have to tell that story of how I helped smuggle film into Egypt. One or the other one. That's another one. This film brought us together, and then... Um, it shaped my life and my practice as a diplomat. So I saw the Sabua, and then was the Sabua first and the Mulid after, or the other way around? Uh, Fadwa, which was first, the Sabua or the Mulid? Okay, so we saw the, the uh, Sabua, and I was fascinated, and I learned a lot about Egypt and Egyptian culture and all that. And even in the Sabua, if I recall, uh, there's a foreshadowing about the Mulid. No? Or, or am I conflating them? Anyway, I, I got to know your oeuvre, and, and then we worked, then she told me about the Mulid, and I was fascinated. And so I was coming to Egypt as a young diplomat, and I said, this Mulid stuff, I gotta figure this out. It resonates with my, I have an Italian background, and we, th there's some resonances with, um, with Egyptian culture. A lot of them. Gender stuff, and, and, and religion, and a lot of other stuff. So I was fascinated. I came to Egypt, and I went to the Mulid as a young diplomat, a long time ago, in the mid-80s. And I became fascinated. I started bringing my ambassador to, to see them. He was fascinated. And I started going one after another. Fine. That was all those years ago. I came back as ambassador decades later, uh, 2005, and I thought, I'm going to keep doing what I love about Egypt. I'm going to go to these wonderful things. So I went, I started going to Moulids, because that's what I used to do. And everybody's amazed that this Chawaga, this, you know, foreign lord, knows what they are and goes, because this isn't for tourists, and it's not for sissies exactly. You need to, you know, like this stuff. So I started going to it, and then I became kind of notorious as the U.S. ambassador who goes to Moulids. What's that all about? And the usual conspiracy theories, is it political? No, it's just because I love it. And I, I was introduced to it um, by Fadwa El-Gindi, and it, it really helped form me as a diplomat in the way I connected across cultures. All to say, Anthropology matters. You never know, if you're a professor of anthropology, how you're going to touch a life and shape it. But it really shaped my professional career, my practice as a diplomat, um, 
never mind as a, a human being. Uh, and then even the reputation I has a diplomat, they said, oh, he's the ambassador who goes to Mulitz. And this is why I go to Mulitz. And anyway, along the way, we, we became good friends because we stayed in touch about it. So that's the story of how the Sabor led to my formation and connection with the Mulitz and a lifelong friendship with an AUC distinguished alumna. Fadwa, thank you for coming again this year to present your film. We have to give Fadwa a proper academic introduction. So um, after graduating from AUC with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, cum laude, uh, uh, Fadwa El-Gindi embarked on a long and distinguished career in the field of anthropology. She's an acclaimed author, documentary filmmaker, anthropologist, and scholar with a PhD in anthropology from the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, she has produced international award-winning visual anthropologies on Arab and Muslim culture, including tonight's film. And also, as President Richard Doney said in his remarks, uh, uh, El Moulid, uh, Egyptian Religious Festival, and hopefully I'll say it right, Robal. Robal. Did I get it right? My students have to correct me with my Arabic, but I try. Uh, these films were produced by the US-based El, uh, El Neal Research, a nonprofit ethnographic laboratory and vi uh, visual research center founded by uh, Fadwa. And as an anthropologist, her research involves fieldwork with Arab, Nubian, and Sapotec cultures and Arab Americans. And uh, I don't want to go through her whole CV. She has more than 80 publications in English, Italian, French, and Russian, Arabic, German, and Spanish. Uh, she serves on editorial boards of prominent scholarly journals. Um, her book, Veil, Modesty, Privacy, and Resistance, has become an anthropological classic and has been translated into several languages. Uh, and she's written several other books, The Myth of Ritual, A Native's Ethnography of Sapotic Life Crisis Rituals, uh, where she adopts innovative methodology of native ethnography, and she has written other groundbreaking anthropological books, uh, including Visual Anthropology, Ess Essential Method and Theory, and By New Prayer, The Rhythm of Islam. Uh, she was the past president of the Society for Visual Anthropology, and she previously, previously served as Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Head of the Department of Social Sciences at Qatar University. She was also a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, and taught uh, anthropology at the University of Southern California um, and the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Georgetown University and her expertise on the Middle East brought her to the Clinton White House, and she frequently gives lectures to diplomats uh, assigned to the Middle East at the Foreign Service Institute of the U.S. Department of State, and she currently lectures internationally and has been recently elected as a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. So welcome, Dr. Fadia, to the podium to tell us about your film. All the wire here. Thank you very much, Helen. <laughs> What do I do? I'm being wired here. What? Uh, I keep it like this, or what do I do? <laughs> I leave it like this? <laughs> Thank you, President of the American University in Cairo. And I, I, I was just um, telling uh, the President that I see a new energy in the university, and I, I feel it, so I think it something happened in the past few years. And thank you, Helen, for all the work you put on all the staff. This is a dynamo. I mean, being back home at the American University in Cairo, you know, the old campus is my home. Um, it's quite a feeling. So I'm happy to be here. Can you hear me well? Do I need a microphone? OK. So um, I'm not giving a lecture or anything. We're going to watch the um, visual ethnography first, El Subo, Egyptian birth ritual, which was filmed maybe 85 and edited and cut and finished 86, 1986. And, um, uh, it's, it's just uh, become a, a classic, and I'll tell you the story after you see it, because 
I'm not a filmmaker and I don't know how to make film. And I keep saying that every time I get an award. I start by saying I don't know how to, <laughs> to make film and then I get an award. Uh, so it must be something else. It has to be anthropology, not the filmmaking part. And so we'll talk about that um, when we're um, we will finish viewing. I think what we'll do is I'll take a few questions that are informative, that is something you want to ask about something you just saw in the film, clarification, as opposed to general question, uh, so that you don't lose it. And after that, we'll, I'll show a few slides of a PowerPoint um, giving context, mostly theoretical anthropological context to the film, because as I said, I didn't make this film as a filmmaker. And really, believe me, I don't know how to make film. But um, after El Sabour, I uh, made, I finished Gorbal, even though I filmed El Moulet first, I finished El Gorbal. The story of the Gorbal is the Gorbal the, uh, where you put the baby in them. And I wanted all the uh, ritual objects in the same film but um, Egypt has a problem. They have a fantastic sense of humor and they are politically very astute. And I kept searching all over uh, Cairo for a Gorbal maker. And I was uh, teaching, so I didn't have that much time. I had to go back to the university to teach. And I went to the Sug and I said, where is a good master Gorbal maker? And they said, well, where the donkeys are because the traditional Gorbal is made with donkey skin, dead donkeys. They don't kill the donkey for the skin, for all those of you who shuddered, you know. And, um, and I said, well, where are all the donkeys? And they said in Munafeya, of course, Sadat was from Munafeya and Mubarak was from Munafeya. So the pun was very clear. He said, all the donkeys of Egypt come from Munafeya. I said, okay. Anyway, the search, uh, time passed, and I couldn't film Gorbal at the time, but I felt for theoretical reasons I need to film Gorbal because it was an important ritual object in that general rite of passage called El Sabu. So that's why I made Gorbal, not because I'm a folklorist who's collecting traditional things to make films about, this was justified theoretically that it's one of the uh, ritual objects in El Cebu that I couldn't catch because of the donkeys of Munufiya. So I, uh, I had time to search and I ended up, guess what? It was in Munufiya. <laughs> That's Egypt. So at the time, they all look at each other, all the donkeys are in Munufiya, and it turns out that the best craftsman was in fact in Munufiya, and I went and filmed it. It became another kind of a film and maybe we'll have a chance in another time when you don't work so hard uh, to uh, talk about Gorbal and how it was made. So now we can watch El Subo. It's, um, I think, uh, 28 minutes. We cut it so that it's classroom time as opposed to see, you know, television time. So it was, uh, I think it's about 28 minutes. So if we see the film now, I will pick up after we see it. What do I do? Turn down the mic so the screen will pop up like this. Ibrahim, Ibrahim, and Muhammad, Ibrahim, 
were born to petty manufacturing. I am told that from the moment of birth, seven angels protect newborns until the seventh day. This is the eve of the Savoir. A big candle in the decorated Savoir pot is lit while the babies remain covered from the eyes of strangers. It is believed that the angels register the newborn's lifespan before the candles are put out by midnight. Coins are dropped into a dish of beans soaking in water to bring about abundance and prosperity. Women dress up both ceremonial pots with gold jewelry, and the father dresses up the boy's pot with his rosary beads. Undecorated and undressed, the Savoir cups are made out of clay in the pottery village in Fosta, historical old Cairo. On one side, there is the old mosque of Ahmed Nawab. On the other side, there is the famous church of Mary Gillies. Savoir cups are used by Muslims and Copts rich and poor, urban and rural. For 150 years, potters, or had the father, have been making pots in this area, passing the craft to the sun. The Tabula pot consists of a base and a long neck. Four candle holders are attached around the top ridge of the base. This pot is adorned with a wavy ring encircling its upper neck. It is a girl's pot called Olla. The Savoura pot only resembles the traditional clay water jar, but it isn't used for drinking. It is a ceremonial object of symbolic value. From birth, a newborn is gender neutral. The Savoura on the seventh day marks the point at which gender is differentiated and the newborn's sexual identity is publicly announced and celebrated. The clay pot represents gender difference. The boy's pot is called a dream. It has a spout attached to one side and a hand to the other. <coughs> These spots are then painted and decorated. In the not too distant past, decorating the Savoir pot like the rest of the war preparation, was done collectively by the family gathered together before the war. Nowadays, the war pots are commercially decorated with satin bows and flowers, and even flashing lights. <laughs> In Egypt today, the Savoir continues to be a family affair, an occasion to express skin solidarity and reaffirm family ties, particularly those through the mother. <laughs> Karina's mother passed away. But only Iman, the mother in law of Karina's brother, stayed with Karina in the hospital and <coughs> took care of her at home. She has the key position in the family. Extended family members are packing candy and peanuts in special sacks for the next day. Peanuts are now the substitute for the more typical roasted chickpeas. As relatives work together, they are all served mobile. It is an additional drink that is primarily for the new mother but is literally offered to all in attendance on the occasion of birth. Mohan is given in large quantities to the new mother after delivery. I was told that to prepare the new mother's body, 
and increases her milk. This round blend is then mixed with nuts at home and roasted in clarified butter. Traditionally, the seventh day after birth was the time when the newborn ceremonially received the name. The boy received the first haircut and was circumcised, and the girl's ears were pierced. Today, as only Iman was saying, all these events take place separately from the Shabur without ceremony, particularly among urbanized families. Only Sayyid, Karima's paternal aunt, is the one who made all the purchases in the bazaar for the Shabur. This is the day of the Shavuot. The family is particularly rejoicing the arrival of a boy. Karima, informally called Osta, remains with the baby. <laughs> In the Shibua, only Sayyid assumes the leadership role. She brings the Shibua pots and candles out from the confinement area to the reception area of the home. Her sister, Omar Khalid, also assumes the central role in the ceremony. Helped by another relative behind her, she brings the babies out of confinement. At this point, the kings have just crossed the threshold. After six days in the humanity, the newborn has just passed out of marginal status to become incorporated into the Egyptian cultural world of kings and detectives. The Hawaii is also brought out, which is a special fit in which only for pussy is accepted. Otherwise, it is used for winning newborns on their seventh day of life. It is then guarded in the family for generations. The ceremony begins with the candle procession. Both kinds of Shabur candles, the big one for the clay pot and the small procession one, are made into a delicate sham in an Oreya Cairo. Candle making, like most traditional crafts in Egypt, is a family craft that passes from father to son. As the father dips the candles in oil, the son is painting another batch. I 
In the past, the role now assumed by Omar Said and her sister Omar Khalid was that of the midwife. Today, the absence of midwives created an opportunity for women in the family or neighborhood skilled in the lore and tradition of the Shabuwa to be called upon as ritual leaders. Oh, 
the second grains are uh, beans, uh, barley, wheat, corn, rice, salt, and uh, lentils. Oh, it was hell. I'm, I'm reliving it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before the babies are fully incorporated, they must be ritually initiated and fortified. Don't listen to that, please. Listen to your grandfather, Ali. Mother, so they know mother. Uh, <laughs> they are looking for her. She yeah, was not feeling well at all. It was terrible. There are other customs from this before. Yes, our forefathers. There she is. The mother is carried with a blanket, and the twins are put on top of it. The mother steps over them seven times. I was told that time with a glass, mortar, and pestle makes a newborn attentive and widowing invigorates him. They have to pay money gifts. Did you ever see these kids in the family of later No, years? everybody asks me. I, I lost contact. There was wars and this and that, and I lost contact of where they live. I don't know anybody to lead me to them. Yeah. I wish, I'm sure they are now in the book. Yeah. I know. This was 85? This is 85. <laughs> My fundraising the best. The best. <laughs> uh, had it been a midwife who delivered, then uh, all this money would have gone to her. And she would know. This would have been her fortune. But today, uh, there is no midwife. We are doing it in ceremony. And there's another one to let for herself. Birth is a time when the strong bonding among women is expressed and further strengthened. Okay. 
many manufacturing standards. The Egyptians celebrate by giving war cries, by singing and dancing.
Yeah, God bless him. Yeah. Small so amount, but I was desperate. I was collecting yeah. 10 pounds here, 10 dollars here, and 10 dollars. Editing in the States is very expensive. Okay, mom can show you the PowerPoint. Okay, if you have any questions that are directly about something you're wondering about in the film, content and so on, small questions before I give some background to the making of the Civil War. Any questions about what you saw? Yes. It wasn't quite clear to me who was the father of the twins. Can you explain his face or his appearance? <laughs> yeah, I had a problem with him, but um, <laughs> he was the one who, while uh, the young woman was dancing, would go in front of the camera back and forth. I, I, I removed very few pieces of this film, all of them were him, because he wanted to be in the camera all the time, and he was wasting our time. He was just a narcissist, but that was the father of the babies. But um, his role is, uh, he's there, but it's the women, really. It's a woman's show. Yeah. And um, what's the relationship of the mother to the other woman? She was pretty sad and like tired. And, uh, very, this is the seventh day after she gave born to twins, and one of them was a cesarean. She was feeling very sick, that's why I didn't film her in, the, in her room. I wanted to film her in the room, but she was very, very sick. So it's not that she was upset, she was really not feeling very well. And also that wonderful husband of hers was, in the, the tension was very high. I mean, you have to understand that getting a rapport and permission to be in such a small flat and have them forget that there is a camera and act naturally requires a lot of work. And the tension was very high. And every time I went to the bedroom where the twins were with the mother, that husband was yelling and so on. So I ran out again. And I really felt like kicking him out of his house, but I couldn't. So it was fine. He's, we managed. She was very, very um, weak and ill and tired and all of this and filming. And her husband was yelling all the time. So. That was the problem. <laughs> yes. The moment you heard from Dr. Dukichi, did the prophet was asked about the appropriateness of the Sabra? Because, I mean, there is a lot of ritual, the, the um, basis of the Sabra, not the basis of the Sabra, but there was a Aqiqa which existed even before Islam. It's now, they are saying it's Islamic, but celebrating the baby was before Islam. But it, it, uh, Islam so it gave it... No, he was asked about the celebration of a baby on the seventh day, and is that really good and Islamic? And um, his answer was, uh, children are a joy, they must be celebrated. Is this in the hadith? Hadith. Because I was just curious, because I heard of Sabua, in particular, with something like Egyptian. Um, Actually, it's all over the Arab world. They have different sab'ay, sab'ay, they have all over the Arab world, they have it. It's the seventh day celebration of a baby uh, with different terms, and then the details are different. So the Egyptians have the ulla abri, and all these decorations, uh, the Lebanese do something else from their traditions. Mm -hmm. But the idea of the seventh, I found out that even in India, in some parts of southern India, they celebrate the seventh day. Is there a relationship with uh, the mother passing over the baby seven times and the fact that the Savoy takes place on the seventh day? It's the same number. It's the same number. But is, is yeah, that, the seventh. The root of it is of, I could trace it to ancient Egypt, um, where the seven Hathors, 
uh, at the gate of the, um, uh, the birth area of queens and so on. So uh, seven is uh, much older than Islam and before Christianity and Judaism. It just marks the area. Actually, it's international. There are uh, Native American Indians have seven also as sacred. But I traced it, of course, uh, within the cultural tradition. And yes, it is it has sacredness. Um, creating um, life took seven days, in ancient Egypt, I mean. And it continued in Judaism and Islam. Okay, I have, uh, do, do you have any other specific questions? I'm supposed to just... Well, if you find um, a family that, yeah, the day easily accepts that you go to their house and film, does these days are very, very good. And every time I try to ask people to film them, and they always either put conditions like, okay, if I go show my face, or is it either think you like go to somewhere else and they are removed, or it's not easy to find someone to film. So in the movie, you actually went to someone's house. This is an excellent question. I, um, I got physically tired watching it because I remembered what happened in 85 just to get to that point. What's your major? Okay, if you're an anthropology, you'd know that there is method that we develop a long time to develop. We go to the field, we immerse ourselves, we learn the art and science of establishing rapport. It sounds like an old-fashioned idea, but that's the key. And I had difficulty finding a baby to film in Egypt, <laughs> where every seven seconds there's a baby coming. <laughs> um, and that's because of my schedule. I come all the way and bring the, the friends who want to work with me on it, and then either something happens, the baby doesn't show up on time. I mean, it's a natural uh, biological phenomenon. Or uh, the mother falls sick or things like that. The third time around, I spread the word. I said, anybody born who is willing to talk to me, I didn't say permit me to film. Uh, so it was the person whom I have chosen as a cameraman, he's a documentary filmmaker, but he does what I tell him, and I'll talk about that. Um, uh, heard about twins being born, both boy and girl, which is ideal, because having a boy, you will have only a boy's ritual, a girl, girl's ritual and symbolism, but having both was just ideal. I didn't choose it, it happened. And he gave me the uh, name of the, the, she was still in the hospital. She just gave birth. And I rushed to the hospital. And I went into the room, introduced myself, and started establishing rapport. I made it, uh, I established rapport very fast with the aunts, uh, Om Sayyid and Umm Khaled, they were all in the room. The room, were pots and pans and carrying televisions going in. I mean, you know, you stay in the hospital and you, Ya Hassan, Ya Muhammad, Ya, and noise and so on, the opposite of uh, hospitals elsewhere. And I sat and I talked to the mother and then the father came in and I said, I live in America and I teach and I'm an anthropologist and I explained that and I want to uh, record naturally a real um, a birth ceremony, not birth, but birth ceremony. And he asked why, and I said for education purposes. And it's, um, he said, then you don't show it on television. I said, agreed, uh, Egyptian television. And I was called to show it on Egyptian television, I should, because I respect the people I filmed more than making the film. And um, so uh, we talked, it took, se I had seven days to work with. Usually we take a year to do that. But I had experience with field work before, that had a lot. And um, so they began to trust me. 
I went all the time and I sat in the room and the mother was really having a very hard time. She was very ill. And um, then they said, okay. I told him it's gonna be hard. Uh, we want to visit your place, your apartment. And I think they were in Salam or something there. Uh, lower, middle, middle, middle class combination of the family. And um, they don't know me except through that, which is, a, I think, is a miracle of, of sorts. And um, I told them that I will be making all the decisions and that they are just to ignore um, that there is a camera and there, there's very little light. I minimized light and we only had one camera and one sound. But it's still very intrusive, and the cameraman tended to be intrusive. He's a documentary filmmaker. He's got a, a different style of filming than in anthropology. So he thought that, you know, when, when the husband, the famous husband, would tell him, bring the camera my way, and he would bring the camera. I had to pinch the cameraman because the sound is running to come back to the babies. I had to make a decision what to film. But the flat is so small. And after a while, as you pointed out, they forgot we were there. Because there are several things in um, Egyptian and Arab families in general that are considered private. One of them is eating. They don't, I mean, having sex and eating, the <laughs> things you don't fill. But they let me do that. And uh, so, um, so in, it looks like I will never get to my slides, but uh, I love your questions, yes. Yes, absolutely, before anybody else. I took a rough cut and made a trip to uh, Cairo to their home, and uh, they looked at it. That's part of our protocol and ethics in anthropology. And I was trembling. I mean, I had uh, the uh, first master's student in visual anthropology from the University of Southern California, Ushi, German. I needed her discipline. And she was uh, with me, and um, we were, I was trembling. She was telling me, I'm trembling. In case they say, we don't like it, don't show it. And I spent so much, and the difficulty of money is in <laughs> bringing the film into Egypt. This is filmed in 16 millimeter. Some of you never even heard of 16 millimeter. This is 16 millimeter camera, not video. And so, um, he said, it's okay, you did some editing. I said, yeah, we have, of course, it's all removing you mostly, but anyway. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the proportion of films you have, uh, you cut, I couldn't cut um, any less than that because of the budget that I had. I just got very little because we filmed something that's very studied and I want to talk a little bit about that. That's what makes it anthropology, not filmmaking. I spent two years studying and interviewing the Subwar before I filmed. Okay, yes. I don't remember, I must admit, I have it in my data because in my interviews, in my study of the war before filming, I uh, interviewed Copts and Muslims. And interestingly, the Copts didn't know Muslims do that. And Muslims didn't know Copts do that, which is very typical of cultural traditions where you live nearby, but you don't know, oh, we thought this is Coptic. Uh, really? We thought ancient, it's ours. No, it's everybody, it's, it's Egyptian. Uh, but I don't remember the details, and um, I'd be glad to correspond with you to look at my notes. Okay, we go through some slides. What do I do here? No, I'm doing something wrong. Ah, I just got that Life Achievement Award from the Society for Visual Anthropology in um, this November, that I, I delayed my trip to Cairo for that reason. When they called me, there's a story to that. I'm doing something wrong here. Okay. 
This one is missing again. This is the flat bed, a 16 millimeter flat bed that you edit 16 millimeter, 16 millimeter film on. And you either rent a room in Hollywood or if you are in a university that had filmmaking, you rent, but it's, you know, you, uh, you compete with everybody else who wants that room. So I bought myself one. And this is in my home in Los Angeles. And that day I was telling my husband, you know, that's it, nobody uses 16 millimeter. And when I call people, they say, ah, oh, it's not even worth $2. It's not even worth $10. But I was nostalgically fond of it. I mean, I made three films on it. And the other film uh, picture that didn't show up shows me on the flatbed. I don't cut, but I choose everything. And then an editor comes and cuts. I don't have the guts to cut. It's a big decision to cut 16 millimeter film, very costly. Um, so, but I sit and uh, any time of the day, because it's in my house, and I say, okay, no, this has to come after this, this has to be done this way for anthropology reasons, not film reasons. A filmmaker, many filmmakers didn't agree with, with how I was making that film. And that day, um, uh, finally, uh, Dwight put it up for sale. He said, whoever wants to get it. And somebody said he's interested to do what? I don't know, something strange with a flatbed. And he came to the house to pick it up. And I was upstairs. I couldn't even look to see him pick it up. And I go to, my, to the email, and they tell me that I got the award for Life Achievement Award, Lifetime Achievement Award for visual anthropology, my contributions to visual anthropology, not to making film, but since it's all integrated. Here I show the three films. Sometimes they're not showing us. Hmm. And the original, um, I guess they are linked to my laptop. Okay, so what is important here, the, this um, picture there is becoming iconic. It's me sitting on the floor in Monofeya interviewing for Orbal. That's a film we didn't show today. So I was sitting with Amma Hoksha, but it's just gone viral. It's, it's um, 86, maybe 87 I filmed it. But that picture somehow people ask for it to put it in uh, museums and exhibits and so on. What's important is that I wrote about visual anthropology. The history of the connection between film and cultural traditions and the theory behind it, my analysis, how I made the Sabor. So anybody who is really interested, you go to the chapters on how I made that much more detailed than what we are uh, discussing today. Um, I stress that some people say you say it too often, too much. I do anthropology, not make film. And what I show here at the left is something I put together at about three o'clock in the morning before we went to the house to film because I realized that my, the people with me, the documentary filmmaker and the cameraman, his son, didn't know what anthropology is. So he knows what documentary film is. He comes from journalism and cinema, not from anthropology. So he was discussing that I'll be doing this, I'll do that. I tell him, no, this is not significant. What is significant in my analysis is X. And what I want to show in the film is the analysis, not the chronology of the film. Like folklorists may sometimes want to just document chronologically a subor and then put it in, you know, on the record in museums and so on. That was not my goal. My goal was to show the analysis of El Subor. And so I sat late, it was Garden City House or something. I don't know if it still exists. I think it's gone by a Cyprus woman. It's the only uh, hotel in Egypt, maybe, that in Cairo that has no television, no telephone, nothing. And it's a very simple bed, you think like you're camping, and very cheap, uh, you know. It. <laughs> and I stayed there because I don't want any noise and I want to focus. And I, when I realized they don't understand what I'm doing, 
I did, I scratched my analysis that we have to uh, put a sabor in terms of aspects, actions, and objects, and the significance of those, because it's the meaning of these traditions that really will last. So some people say, why are you showing this is old, nobody does this? Actually, they still do. But what is important for me and in anthropology is to get the significance of the meanings of what they're doing, because that will last. That's how we are still celebrating the seventh. Ancient Egyptians do it, 7,000 years old is a long time. So meanings and importance actually last, but the actual action or object may not, may change over time, and that's okay too. Um, so this is one, is that uh, by doing this, a method got developed and uh, that you show film, you show analysis, not chronology of action. Uh, the other film, I show a field, a field interview, and then I cared to integrate the visual in the mainstream anthropology. So the book veil that was talked about uh, benefits from visual analysis. So I found that the veil and the mashrabeya, this kind of veil, the burqa of Afghanistan, and the mashrabeya are identical. It's a piece of architecture. This. She's taking her house and walking with it. She sees and nobody sees her, and that's the idea of the uh, mashrabeya architecture. So I integrated in the book the visual analysis, and that makes it visual anthropology as opposed to filmmaking. The other thing I tried to do is I tried to put all of visual anthropology uh, in a genealogy. Because people say, oh, you're doing documentary or you're making a film. I say, no, I'm not making a film. And I'm not doing documentary. We use very different principles. So I found that there is, I divided into ethnographic and scientific. Scientific meaning building of knowledge and based on research. Ethnographic filmmaking is not necessarily based on research, even though it's ethnographic. And I put the names of famous people like Marshall and uh, Tim Ash and uh, MacDougall and John Bishop and so on in the ethnographic. Uh, if you take visual anthropology, these names are known. And the scientific, I found that we have pioneers, uh, Le Boas, Griot, who ex experimented with photography and filmmaking, and they are part of the history of visual anthropology. Bateson and Mead, who did actually scientific film that is cited and is now in the um, National Museum. Uh, there is a German tradition, there is French tradition. Well, the French tradition, Jean Rouge did his own thing. And he goes around with cameras, so he, he puts art in it and cinema, and documentary, and mixes all of that. But he's, this, he's a one-man show. He's, um, uh, he didn't leave a school of people doing that. They don't know how to. It has to be Jean Rouge. And when he died, it's sort of gone with him. Um, and the contemporary traditions, I divided into filming others, filming selves, research film. That is, you do film that is just expression of research. There's nothing fun in it. It's all research and visual ethnography. I didn't realize that what I was doing was a new genre, and that probably explains all the awards. They don't know either that I have a new genre. I think, I thought that by doing anthropology, not making film, that I'm antagonizing everybody, and I was. Antagonizing people in film, and they said, this is not interesting, and, but it got all the awards that the cultural identity is very clear in there, um, the um, systematic, you did several things like cutting in and out from interviews into action. So I broke the chronology usually, the documentaries usually don't, and many things. And I didn't realize that by doing this, I'm introducing a new genre in that field, and I call it visual ethnography. I think I'm the first to one to use that term. Now it's used a lot. And that it's not ethnographic film, it's not documentary, it's visual ethnography. It's like writing a book. And I felt the same way when we were editing this that I feel when I'm constructing a book together from data. Because I, st I had data and I was constructing, and I say, no, if we do it this way, we are violating X, the analysis that says X. And at that time, people were saying, come on, just remove two minutes and it's fine, the film is fine. 
After that, the award, they keep saying it's, it captures cultural identity. It captures this, it does this, and then when I wrote about it, it became a, a, an actual genre. And this is what's the point. This is when I was the head of the department in Qatar. And of course, I'm trying to introduce the visual. That was not an easy matter. And I was the, in the middle there, dressed as I usually do, all in white. And, uh, you know, they wanted to take pictures with me, so we were taking the pictures. Then when I put it on the screen, at least one came and said, no, you can't do that. I said that they can't really see you. I mean, she said, no, everybody identifies me. It's just you who can see me, but everybody else knows who I am. And the one who complained was the one who was most covered. So I kept thinking, I mean, this is a visual anthropology debate. What's the point of taking a picture visual? The uh, Qatari women uh, have a uh, strong sense of privacy. You cannot take a picture of it. They'll stop you in the street, they'll call the police, and you'll go to jail. But uh, men are a public domain. You can picture them anytime you want. But women, the minute you hold the camera, they trust me, that's why they let me take this picture, but the minute you hold the camera and they feel that they are in view, you'll be in trouble. So there is this sense of me being in a picture is something to really um, think about and the role of the visual and identity and privacy and tradition and so on. And I end here. So, any questions? I don't know how to close this, yeah. You won't go away. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One, one has to do with the still picture versus film. It, is there a difference in that regard? Okay. Uh, and that's just a very good question. Uh, the other question has to do with sound. That first, technically, um, a lot of us in the room use video cameras, phones to make videos. The sound and the picture are recorded together. With your 16 millimeter camera, it didn't record sound, I assume. No, it was it synced. Did. Yeah, it, so it was recorded sync. Record. We had problems with our equipment, but it but, recorded but, but sync. But you must have done sound editing also after. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so I was just wondering, because you, you, you talk about visual anthropology, but obviously it is also sound and you have singing to, and all of that. So I just absolutely, to absolutely. Um, that's why visual anthropology sort of crosses over to the art and so on. But you can stress whatever you feel should be stressed. And I felt that my field is anthropology. And once you move to visual, you become an artist. But no, I think I can, instead of write an ethnography, I'm going to make a film ethnography. And so I have to abide by the rules of the ethnography. One thing I didn't mention, that there is a theory here. In anthropology, there's some, something called rite of passage. I don't know how many anthropology students here, they heard about rite de passage. In 1890, I think, the uh, Van Gennep from Belgium identified um, a kind of ceremony or ritual that is universal. So there is no culture or group of people that doesn't have it. And the laqiqa would be considered a ritual. A birthday, uh, American birthday, English birthday is considered a ritual. Ritual is passing from one phase to the other in your life. And what this anthropologist identify is that the character of these phases is identical also. You first separate, then you are in, a f in no man's land, and then you re-enter the world. All rituals have that. This is a universal human phenomenon. And non-humans don't do it, but humans do it universally. Okay, so I had to show that El Sabor is a rite of passage. So I had to show that there was a separation, there was an, an, a, a crossing the threshold. I don't know if you remember, taking the babies and crossing the threshold and then re-entering the social world and men become men and women become women, etc. And that film 
um, reveals that theoretical part in anthropology, which is the rite of passage. I don't think we have any other film that shows that. And that also is part of the significance why the film was very important, is that it shows rite of passage as it should be in its three phases. And that's universal. And that reminds me of um, Dr. Tare, who is here. He was a student at the time at the University of Southern California, and I was on his committee in architecture. Now he's a famous architect in Egypt. And I needed some Egyptians to see the rough cut to get you know, views. Am I doing right? Did I miss something? What's the meaning of halaatak uh, bergalatak and things like that? So I put the rough cut, and then I was saying, well, the ritual and uh, Tare looked at me and said, it's not a ritual, it's ordinary. And that's a common thing. Like if you tell an American the birthday is a ritual, it's not a ritual, it's a birthday. Uh, right, it's a conceptual point we make that there are certain activities that are done in exactly the same form, universally, the whole world. So uh, other fields don't recognize that. I was writing something from the perspective of Islamic studies, and I said, la'aqiqa is ritual. He was shocked, because the word ritual implies barbarianism, or I don't know what. It's not a ritual. And that's very common, and that's interesting. That's why anthropology should be aware of that, that a ritual is a technical term and a technical term about an activity that's universal. All human beings do it. When you see the President of the United States being accepted for office, that's ritual and it has a structure and we know it in anthropology and they follow it exactly. Not in terms of the details of what they do, but the pattern of separation, liminality, re-entry is universal. So that's a point I tried to make in the Sibor. So it's not simply an old tradition I want to preserve. That wasn't my goal. Uh, Fadwa, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. As ever, having you at AUC is wonderful. And I remember the last time when we were doing the Cairo papers and you gave the keynote about uh, visual anthropology. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, you said something very interesting, uh, like writing a text and ethnography and doing a visual ethnography. As an anthropologist, how does the difference in the medium through which we communicate knowledges actually shapes the way you think about ethnographic fieldwork interpretation and the questions of representation? Because I think there is something immensely rich in the visual in that sense that the words sometimes do not allow us to, to say. So I would like to hear from you on that. The second question relates to El Ghurbal. Uh, El Ghurbal, ah, okay. the object. Uh, again, another point which is very interesting is that this was 1980s. Uh, and at that time, we haven't read Latour, we haven't talked about object agency and the object as the central part of, which is fundamental to current debates in anthropology. What made the object so central in your analysis at that time that it took us actually quite a bit of time in anthropology to recognize the centrality of things and how do they actually become an inseparable part of our social lives in that sense? Oh, your question is too deep. Um, the, uh, my, I'll, I'll start with the second one. The um, centrality of the object had to do with the completion of the ethnography, in my case here. That is, the ethnography would not be complete if it didn't have all the objects, and if you notice what I did with the candles, I traced where they got the candles, and then the candle maker and the purchasing of the candle, giving it context. And I wanted to do the same with Orbal, except for you know Egyptian humor. And um, and um, so I made a whole film on Orbal, but it wasn't relating to Sabor. It became another genre at how to do an interview in the field on camera from scratch. So the Ghorbal is a completely different uh, film. The first one, how does 
making film affect ethnography? Actually, I think ethnography affected my making of the film. That is, I was, I never had to ask myself when I'm writing, I never ask myself, how do I present that? I just write it. But how do I present it visually? And as you said, there is sound, there is things to cut. Um, decision making is much more difficult because I am, I am writing or making that ethnography for 28 minutes. And look at how compact it is. And that's what filmmakers at USC, they have a big cinema school. And they felt this was really not going to go. This is not cinema. And I said, it isn't. And, um, but it's not cinematic. It's not, um, you know, I compacted it with knowledge. I compacted it with knowledge. And my goal was always, those, OK, where is the third phase? Where is the first phase of the ritual? This object, I have to trace it. Um, and all the analysis was done before filming. So that I went out, I spent two days doing the contextual material. Doesn't look like that. And then uh, two days with the subwoofer itself, because there is the eve of the subwoofer and the subwoofer, and I went both times uh, to the house. The arrest was with Omi Sayyid. Uh, well, the pottery village that didn't require anybody, but Omi Sayyid, I had to get permission from her, who said, but her husband can't see her when we come and pick her up, and, I, and we had to maneuver uh, to get her out of the house. It was very, very dynamic, but she was willing to come with me and do the purchases. I told her, you are going to purchase things for the Subo anyway, can I come with you and film? And because we had very good rapport, she said yes. And so we went. But at some point, she got very angry during the filming in uh, Lgoreya, I think we were, um, that I just stopped. And she said, this is, this is it. This is intruding in my life. Uh, my husband's probably home. I didn't cook. And I kept thinking, now we, we spent about $20,000. What do I do? And then I said, anthropology, anthropology. She's more important. So I stopped. I asked the cameraman to stop. I told her, look, it's going to cost me a lot, career-wise, money-wise, but you are more important. So if you want to go home, I'll take you home now. She looked at me and said, continue. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked. But I was, again, trembling. But I thought that if I give them the priority in everything, the human part, which is not different in writing or filmmaking. So I don't know. I have to think about your question uh, more, whether it did affect my uh, writing of ethnography. Um, that is, it raised a certain consciousness. It's possible. It's possible that when I was doing Veil and I was doing the analysis of that, it came from the, the filmmaking. Um, I don't do photography, I didn't uh, answer your question. I don't do photography, but the photographers who are highly valued in anthropology are the ones who do ethnographic photography. Um, the human side comes clear. It's not just the object, but the humanness of the object comes forth. And um, um, who is the famous photographer? Uh, he worked on the Navajo, I don't remember. Um, but the difference is exactly that, the humanness in the photography. Otherwise, it's beautiful photography, and I have n nothing against art or film or anything. I just don't do it. Okay? And I tell you, I, you know, whenever anybody asks me, I think I have a problem. I said, probably you didn't have a subwoofer. That's why. You just have a good subwoofer and you will live a long life happily. 